What does it mean that the one true holy Catholic Church that Jesus died to and rose to give us is apostolic? Why is prayer not optional but necessary? Why do we sometimes not obtain what we pray for? This and much more today on The Simple Truth. I'm Jim Havens. It is Thursday Catechesis, where we strive to faithfully hand on the authoritative, essential, and fundamental contents of Catholic doctrine in faith and morals for ongoing formation and ongoing conversion with our co-host every Thursday, Father Jeff Fashing. He's a priest of 26 years, known for his unwavering preaching of authentic Orthodox Catholicism. You can support his good work by going to givesendgo.com com slash veritas and we always consecrate everything here to the sacred heart of jesus through the immaculate heart of mary and the pure strong heart of saint joseph father fashing always great to have you with us how are you today and will you lead us in an opening prayer doing very well jim great to be with you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost amen hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Saint Athanasius, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right. Our topic today on this fourth, coming out of the fourth Sunday after Easter, we're going to the Roman Catechism, Catechism of the Council of Trent, edited under St. Charles of Borromeo, published by the decree of Pope St. Pius V in 1566, a phenomenal resource. And so in the sermon program in the front of this text, we've got the fourth Sunday after Easter for the priest to preach on the apostolicity of the church and prayer, its nature, its fruits, its parts. So we start to get into uh, breaking open some catechesis on prayer uh, today. And uh, I think uh, this will be a theme that, that continues for a little bit here, which is great. Um, but Father, why don't you get us started? The apostolicity of the church, and then a little bit later we'll get into prayer and its nature, fruits, and parts. Sure. Let's just start with the very first paragraph. The catechism reads that the true church is also to be recognized from her origin, which can be traced back under the law of grace to the apostles, for her doctrine is the truth not recently given, nor now first heard of, but delivered of old by the apostles and disseminated throughout the entire world. Hence, no one can doubt that the impious opinions which heresy invents opposed as they are to the doctrines taught by the church from the days of the apostles to the present time are very different from the faith of the true church. So let's just take that, Jim. We're talking about how the one true faith, the Catholic faith, was the only faith founded by Jesus Christ. And it's been handed on through the first apostles, by the first apostles, to their successors, the current hierarchy or the current bishops. So especially when it comes with respect to faith and morals, the church can't err in her teachings. And we celebrate one of the great doctors of the church today, St. Athanasius, Jim. And you might be aware that one of the stipulations, there's a, a whole list of things that must be realities for a person, man or woman, to be, clear, to be declared, quote, unquote, a doctor of the church. One of those, Jim, is that their teachings, with respect to faith and morals especially, is without er error, which means that whatever they taught through the Catholic faith, is truth. It was truth when they taught it. It was truth after they taught it. It's truth now. It's always truth because if something is truth, Jim, as you know, it doesn't change. So that's one of the beauties of being part of this true faith that Christ founded, that even though we may have sinful men in charge, sinful men running the institutional church, still the deposit of faith, and this is what Bishop Strickland was doing such a good job of and still is, is continuing his job to hand that on as a successor to the apostles, the true deposit of the faith, you know, which is what people are entitled to be taught and heard. And that's the whole point of us using the Catechism of the Council of Trent, that the whole theme is this is specifically what pastors need to be instructing their flocks in, in what the material is that we're giving forth here. So, it's that word you mentioned, going back to the time of the apostles, or tradition with a capital T. And you couple that with scripture, which we use a lot on the show, and we don't separate the two. So in that last line of this paragraph, it's talking about those 
who oppose these doctrines taught by the church from the days of the apostles, hence those who have splintered off. And all we have to do is study church history. Every Protestant sect or denomination or any other religion that is not of the true religion, that is, that is not Catholic, has splintered off from the true religion at some point in history or was just created. Okay, that's not true with the Catholic Church. So, of course, they are one degree or another going to be heretical or false, some to greater degrees than others. So I think that's a great way to start that if we're talking about faith and truth and prayer, we want to first acknowledge what really is true and what we want to center our prayer, what doctrine, Jim, we want to center our prayer around, not a false yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what really strikes me here, which is very interesting. We've been doing these shows for a while now following this sermon program in, in the front of the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And, um, and really, really interesting. But this time it struck me because it usually gives us a whole lot on these topics and says, Hey, look at this big chunk. And then the priest or the pastor is, is supposed to preach out of this. This first part on apos- the apostolicity of the church today. It only gives us two paragraphs from the Catechism of the Council of Trent. You read the one. I, I'd like to read the other and, um, and yeah, flesh out a little bit more what you're saying there, because there's a phrase in here that talks about that splintering off from the church in very explicit terms, actually saying that this is guided by the spirit of the devil. Uh, so that's a very different way of thinking about it than the way uh, that we often think about it in the times that we're living in where things have been so ordered to uh, ecumenism, ecumenical activity. Let's first, though, understand the truth of things. Yes, let's work together where we can with folks, but let's also never um, not be holding to what is actually the objective truth of things. Jesus died to bring into the fold, bring us in, incorporate us into his very life, into one church, one holy Catholic apostolic church. We have this apostolic succession. It talks about it here. It says that all therefore might know which was the Catholic church, the fathers guided by the spirit of God added to the creed, the word apostolic for the Holy ghost who presides over the church governs her by no other ministers than those of apostolic succession. This laying on the hands, laying on of the hands that has been this unbroken line. It says this spirit first imparted to the apostles has by the infinite goodness of God always continued in the church. And just as this one church cannot err in faith and morals, since it is guided by the Holy Ghost, so on the contrary, all other societies arrogating to themselves the name of church must necessarily, because guided by the spirit of the devil, be sunk in the most pernicious errors, both doctrine and moral. It's saying when you splinter off from the church and you and you try to start your own church, you're going to fall into these pernicious errors doctrinally and morally, whereas the one true Catholic church that Jesus gave us, we don't have those errors, the doctrine, the moral teaching, rock solid. However, there is grave corruption up and down the, the, the family line within the Catholic church in terms of the actions of the people. There are sinners in the church, um, but the church in and of itself, in doctrine, in morals, in faith and morals, this is the spotless bride of Christ to which we are called to uh, to enter into this sacramental life and to say yes to living by these truths that he has transmitted to us now over these 2,000 years, Father. Yes, and this sin and scandal that we're talking about, Jim, is nothing new. It's gone on from the very beginnings of the church, from Judas on down to the present time. So scandal is nothing new. The reality of sinful behavior will always be there, but that's something different from the true deposit of faith that you are articulating. So that's the beauty of the faith. If we're going to be people who want to talk about prayer and how to pray, which is the whole point of this show, we want to embrace truth first. And Jim, I don't want to deviate, but I just happened to come across an article, and I don't really read that many uh, news articles, but this came out, I believe, from the AP Press just this morning. And I just want to quote a little bit of that article because we're talking, we're, we're, we're going into talking about, you know, how we pray and why we pray and fruits of prayer. And so before we do that, we, again, we want to envelop ourselves in the truth, not in error. That doesn't mean we might not make an error, but we want to know what the truth is. 
like we present on this show, the Catholic truth, Orthodox, authentic Catholicism. So first and foremost, we make this point that the Catholic Church is apostolic. It's the only faith that can be traced back to the time of the apostles in unbroken succession. And Jim, you mentioned how Christ died for this faith. Yes, he did. But I want to reiterate, he didn't just die. We know he suffered a cruel passion, a humiliating death, an agonizing torture. And he did it for his bride, which is one holy Catholic apostolic church, Jim, and no other. Yes. Yeah, he suffered, died, and rose in love of us to draw us together as one in him in his holy Catholic Church, one true holy Catholic Church. And this is a kingdom that, yes, it's at hand, um, and yet it, uh, in, in its fullness, will go on for all eternity. We want to say yes, we want to enter into that now and keep running forward in the grace of God unto eternity uh, with him and with one another. This is what it's all about. We're going to get into prayer. How do we actually communicate with God in a life of prayer? Why is it a necessity, not an option? What are the fruits? What are the parts? A lot of great stuff here to come today. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Jeff Fashing. We are talking about the apostolicity of the church and prayer today. Prayer, its nature, its fruits, and its parts. As we get into this section on prayer in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it sends us to part four of the Catechism on the Lord's Prayer, fittingly. And as it uh, it gets into um, what the what the the pastoral office, one of the duties of the pastoral office, it says, is to instruct them uh, on Christian prayer. Right? We need to know how to pray. It says to understand how and for what they are to ask God, for what they are to ask God. So, um, yeah, that'd be helpful to have some uh, basic understanding on the nature of prayer. And where it starts is to say, look, it's necessary. We are made for prayer. It says the first place in the first place, the necessity of prayer should be insisted upon. Prayer is a duty not only recommended by way of counsel, but also commanded by obligatory precept. Christ the Lord declared this when he said we should pray always. And, you know, the uh, the, the newer catechism uh, from uh, promulgated uh, St. Uh, John Paul II, 1992, I believe they have this great uh, paragraph in there that talks about how, yes, this is the goal to pray always as our Lord Jesus calls us to. And yet that's only possible if we pray, um, if we set up times of prayer where we really give him our full attention. So, so to, the way I think of it is like these pillars of prayer that we set up throughout the day, uh, I would say at least following the traditional um, way of prayer that the church offers us, which is morning prayer and night prayer or evening prayer. You'd have these two columns to begin and end your day where you're going to give your full attention uh, to God and to spend some time in prayer with him there. Now, various ways we can do that. The church has some great uh, some great wisdom for us and great resources for us there um, but the the point being here is that this is uh, fundamental to our lives and necessary we must pray and the goal should be so that even as we're going about our work and what we do throughout the day we still have this sense of the presence of God we're still praying as we go about our various activities but that's only possible if we really set those times aside throughout the, the day to really give him our full attention in prayer father please continue on That's absolutely true. All those things, as far as prayer goes, we want to be structured. We want to remember that God is a God not of chaos and disorder, but a God of order. And so we want to order our spiritual lives as best we can. And I'm not just talking about the priests and the religious out there, but everybody is called to this kind of structure you're alluding to, Jim. But I really want to take this to begin a little different direction than I think you're expecting. And because when we talk about prayer, there are many forms of prayer. And we go into that in this section that the Council of Trent gives us. But when we talk about going back to apostolic faith, going back to what can be traced back to the time of Christ and unbroken succession, this deposit of faith, and we mention prayer, we have to mention the Mass, Jim. And so 
There are many forms of prayer, but the way we give the God the most glory is by participating in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So what kind of Masses are we attending? What kind of Masses are we getting? Now, I would strongly argue, and we don't have time to go into on this show, as far as which form of the Mass gives more to more glory to God. And it's very clear that the traditional Latin Mass gives God immensely much more glory than the Novus Ordo Mass. Now, with respect to the Mass and prayer, when we pray, the Mass is a prayer. And the Church has always taught us, you mentioned the New Catechism, specifically teaches us that our lives revolve around the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So that is really the greatest form of prayer. So we want to ask ourselves right now, at this moment, how are we praying with respect to the Mass? Listen to this, Jim. The sole purpose for which we were created, as you know, is to know, love, and serve God. And so any failure to do so can only be ruinous to our souls. Pope Pius XII wrote the following, Jim, quote, in his document, Mediator Dei. He said, quote, all the faithful should be aware that to participate in the Eucharistic sacrifice is their chief duty and supreme dignity, and that not in an inert and negligent fashion, giving way to distractions and daydreaming, but with such earnestness and concentration that they may be united as closely as possible with the high priest, unquote. So again, everything revolves around the Mass. So are we doing it right? And I want to go to this article that I alluded to, and I just randomly came across it, and it coincides with the material for today. And again, it's put out by AP Press. But It talks about this movement that's happening throughout the country, and I just want to quote the article. Across the U.S., the Catholic Church is undergoing an immense shift. Generations of Catholics who embrace the modernizing tide sparked in the 1960s by Vatican II are increasing. And that's true, Jim, that there's there's this poison that's infected the church and its modernism. But the article says... Those generations are increasingly giving way to religious conservatives who believe the church has been twisted by change with the promise of eternal salvation replaced by guitar masses, parish food pantries, and causal differences to church doctrine. The shift molded by plummeting church attendance, increasingly traditional priests, and growing numbers of young Catholics searching for more orthodoxy has reshaped parishes across the country, leaving them sometimes at odds with Pope Francis and much of the Catholic world. The changes are not happening everywhere. There are still plenty of liberal parishes, plenty that see themselves as middle of the road. Despite their growing influence, conservative Catholics remain a minority, yet the changes they have brought are impossible to miss. And I want to come back to that article. But the point is, is that when we pray, we want to give God the most glory we can. So if we're going to talk about prayer, we have to begin with the Mass and how we're participating in the Mass And what form of the Mass are we choosing to attend? Okay, so the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, again, we've said this many times on the show, is the re-presentation of Calvary. So it's the very same sacrifice that you were talking about, Jim, that Christ laid down his life for his church, his bride, made present on that altar. It's just in an unbloody manner. And so prayer really begins with the Holy Sacrifice, And the church teaches us clearly, again, to just repeat, that our lives are supposed to be rooted in that and revolve around it. And we've said on this show many times that even if we're not able to go to daily Mass, even though we're obliged on Sundays, of course, we're always supposed to live in such a manner that we're ready, interiorly and exteriorly, to receive Holy Communion, because the Eucharist is the source and summit of our lives as Catholic Christians. So those who have splintered off, And the Catechism says it very clearly, and you read it, Jim, guided by the spirit of the devil, they don't have that Eucharist, and they don't have holy orders. So they are clearly in grave error. And the the infallible truth that's always been explicitly proclaimed by fathers and doctors of the Church up until about the time of Vatican II is that these heretics and schismatics have to return and repent This was the message of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Return to the true faith, embrace the Catholic faith, repent of your sins if you want to be saved. And that message is no less true today. So how can something that was proclaimed prior to the 1960s that was truth with respect to embracing the true faith if we want to be saved somehow change? It hasn't. It's just that it's not taught. It's not proclaimed. 
And so if the powers that be were truly concerned, I mean, it reveals, I would argue, true colors and really what's going on. Because it proves they don't really, to a large degree, care for your souls because they're not telling you the truth. They're, for whatever reasons, just not proclaiming the truth. That's one of the reasons we're going through the catalyst, the catechism of the Catholic trend. You can't deny it. And one of those infallible truths is that there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Christ founded one true church. It's not his will that there be all these splinter groups and all these sects. Hey, God is not a God of division like that. He's a God of unity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So this is one of those just really that goes to the root of so many of the levels of corruption that's going on in the church. Is This is just one great example, but it's one of the most important ones that you're not hearing, okay? Because there's this notion of, as I mentioned, Jim, I don't have to tell you, of modernism and relativism that's even infected the Catholic Church, I mean, you had a bishop who, let's just leave him go unnamed, most people know who I'm talking about, that was directly asked by a person of Jewish descent, do I need to be Catholic to be saved? And he didn't tell him the truth. He had an opportunity to say, yes, you need to convert, return to the Catholic faith. But he said, no, the Catholic way is the privileged way, and I'm paraphrasing. So these are the things that we're hearing and you're entitled to hear just the opposite from your leaders, Jim. And so this is one of the problems that we're having because we're really basically talking about <laughs> division. And God is not yeah. a God of division. So when we talk about prayer, prayer is supposed to unify us. The mass is supposed to unify us. Right. And, and that's why we do uh, these shows, particularly this show really focused on catechesis now on Thursdays is because Look, everybody, we need to, if we haven't gotten this by now about the times that we live in, uh, we must be really sleeping and it's time to wake up if that's you, if you don't already get this. But the fact is, is that uh, we are not being well formed by those that are most um, charged with our formation which would be the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, the, the bishops, and I would say even the Holy Father himself. We're just not getting the formation that we ought to be getting, that uh, that true charity would give. But, but then again, then you have to ask the question, well, you can't give what you don't have, and who formed those men? And that's where you trace it back and get into some interesting historical study. But where does that land us? For me, it lands us that, look, this is for us to see and to learn. Let's go back to the catechisms of old. I, I think the new catechism is pretty great, too. But let's also go back to those older catechisms as well and make sure we're getting a comprehensive understanding of what the church is handing on in faith and morals. And so we want to receive this and why we want to live it to the full. And so we want to advance in living it to the full and point the way back by our example, by our words, whatever we can do. But first and foremost, it is us receiving it and then striving to live it by God's grace, which brings us back to prayer. We're not going to get too far on our own without Jesus. We can do nothing. And so he's calling us to this life of prayer, which is centered on the Sunday Mass, the Sunday Eucharist, and Holy Days of Obligation, which are to be treated as Sundays. And so, look, that's where it begins for us to really center our lives on and set up those pillars of, of prayer, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, the, you, you bring up some good questions about the form of the Mass and thinking about these things. Uh, Father, what else do you want to share? Well, Jim, you're probably aware that this upcoming summer, there's the big... Uh Eucharistic Congress taking place in Indiana, and I'm actually going to take place in another, not a counter, but something alongside that, to really reiterate the fact that we don't need to, as the hierarchy, to spend $28 million on a Eucharistic revival. What we need is what we're talking about. We need priests who are priests of the Holy Eucharist, priests who truly have their days literally revolve around the Eucharist. Like you said, you cannot give what you don't have, and that's what you're not getting that you're entitled to with respect to your clergy, both bishops and priests, is men who are truly on, truly on fire and in love with the Eucharist and teaching people the reality of what the Eucharist is, Jim. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to be back with much more uh, today when we get back. If you want to call in, one 511 5483 We'll be right back. Truth, Jim Havens here with Father Jeff Fashing. 
Uh, so looking at prayer, its nature, its fruits, its parts in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Father, I want to connect back to that for a moment, but then, yeah, feel free to go wherever you want to go today. You're always uh, free to, to speak whatever it is uh, that strikes you and that stirs in you. That's one of the, the things I love about these shows. And, and just to, I guess, break what uh, what might be called the, the fourth wall a, a little bit, it's kind of fun to do that too. And, and look, we don't we do a lot of prep on our own. I can speak for myself. I really spend a lot of time with this content, really digesting it. And that's a great gift for me to be able to have time to do that. This That's one of the gifts of this work that, that I'm doing here. Thanks be to God. Um, and um, But at the same time, you're doing your prep, I'm doing my prep, and we don't really talk much about it beforehand. Maybe right before the show today, we didn't really have time to even do that, which I kind of like. Because then I don't really know where you're where you're going to go. You don't really know where I'm going to go. It's kind of fun, kind of exciting that way. I think to kind of just let God guide it. And so, um, so yeah, feel free to do whatever you want to do. Uh, but I do want to connect it back. I think it connects back very strongly to uh, the Catechism of the Council of Trent on prayer in, in this uh, this area that we're going through today. It does speak some really wonderful things. We might want to come back to that at some point in the show, the fruits of prayer and really say that, look, the necessity to pray, it's not like some burden being imposed upon us. If we we receive it like that, then we are wrong. This is a great gift, this necessity of prayer, because God wants to bless us. He wants to bear fruit in our lives, in us and through us, things that we would never be able uh, to, to experience without him. And this is actually what we're made for. Uh, Birds fly, fish swim, man prays. This is our very nature. We are meant to be connected with God and living a life of prayer and things start to come alive. Uh, we begin to come alive. God, uh, what, what's the St. Irenaeus quote that uh, uh, God's glory is man fully alive or something to those of that effect. But uh, it, it goes through this and goes through the fruits of prayer, really great stuff. But then it lands on this uh, these degrees of prayer. And this is what I want to connect this to, what you're saying, um, because I think this is very, very helpful that um, there are these degrees of prayer. You've got the highest degree of prayer, which is the prayer of the just. Then you've got the second degree of prayer, the prayer of sinners, third degree of prayer, the prayer of unbelievers, and the lowest degree of prayer, the prayer of the impenitent. And so these first three degrees are really about, look, God is, is, as long as you're faithful to the grace that you're given wherever you're at, he's leading you forward, whether that's running forward in his grace as the prayer of the just does, or whether that's moving forward as one who is um, weighed down by the guilt of mortal sin, like the prayer of sinners, that degree of prayer, as long as you are repentant and you're striving to move forward with that humility and repentance, even the prayer of unbelievers, it says, is offered by those who has not yet been illumined with the life of faith, but who, when the divine goodness illumines in their souls the feeble natural light, are strongly moved to the desire and the pursuit of truth, and to more earnestly pray for a knowledge of it. If they persevere in such dispositions, God in his mercy will not neglect the earnest, their earnest endeavors. And it says, uh, we see this verified by the example of Cornelius the centurion, the doors of the divine mercy are closed against none who sincerely ask for his mercy. So wherever you are at right now, maybe you have never expressed even an act of faith in Jesus and in his Catholic church before, but by God's grace, he's drawing you right now. He's tapping on your heart right now, and you can make that act of faith right now and start moving forward in that grace. The doors of divine mercy are closed against none who sincerely ask for that mercy. So uh, that lowest degree of prayer, the prayer of the impenitent, those who, uh, it says, not only do not repent of their sins and enormities, but adding crime to crime, dare frequently to ask pardon of God for those sins in which they are resolved to continue um, the prayer of such sinners is not heard by God. It says, whoever lives in this deplorable condition should be vehemently exhorted to wean himself from all affection to sin and to return to God in good earnest and from the heart. So these are important distinctions for us to understand. And we don't know where people's souls are at, even though we can see evidence of where they might be um, with faith or without faith in their lives by looking at their actions and all of that. That's all fair, uh, but we don't know their souls or the grace that's been given to them and all of that. Um, so I just want to say that for those who hear what Father is saying today and talking about the forms of the Mass, 
Look, I, I know all of these degrees of prayer. I've been in all of them before. Thanks be to God, I, I'm in the prayer of the just now and, and running for it by God's grace. But that is all by his grace. He has step by step helped me to to move forward with him. Thanks be to God. Um, and, and so, yeah, I go to I go to the Latin Mass every every Sunday, Holy Day of Obligation. And if I can get the daily Mass, we got a far, quite a bit of a far drive to get there from where I live. But uh, but yeah, love to get there. And I rarely go to the Novus Ordo now simply because it is extremely difficult for me to find one that really does give reverence to God in a way that is even faithful to the rubrics of the Novus Ordo itself. So many, so many abuses, Eucharistic abuses with respect to um, communion in the hand and, uh, and not using the paten with respect to, um, you know, not allowing really or, or making it difficult to have kneeling uh, and receiving on the tongue, no altar rail, no putting the kneeler out. And, and also um, the, the thing that drives me um, just nuts when I see it because it's such an easy fix is the extraordinary, the extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion when they're not needed, they're there's no reason for them to be doing this. And yet there they are. And then I've got to kind of try to take my whole family in the line where the priest is. It's awkward. I don't want to do that. And so it's just easier for me to to say, you know what? Um, it's to a point where it's so distracting from the prayer I'm trying to enter into with our Lord that, yeah, I'm going to go to the uh, extraordinary form. The, the Latin mass, if at all possible. And yeah, if there are times where, uh, you know, there, there's no way around it, then there's no way around it. I'm going to go to mass and regardless of what the form is. But, um, but yeah, I think that God is pouring out the grace to take us further. So if you've never been to a Latin mass and, and this is an invitation to you to maybe check it out, maybe you'll find a greater reverence there and a greater ability to enter into prayer, uh, than, than you've, um, experienced before in a Novus Ordo mass. Father, please continue. Yeah, all absolutely great points. And I actually wanted to start with that last lowest degree of prayer and tie it back into that article I referred to, because it goes right to the point that you're making. So the prayer of the impenitent, the prayer of such sinners is not heard by God. So that's my point is, Jim, I want to lead people to the truth. I want the people to know the truth as I know it in my limited way as a limited human being. But the truth in its fullness, which is found only in the Catholic Church. In fact, the Catholic Church is always taught. And let me ask you this, Jim, when was the last time you heard this statement? Maybe it was on this show. Maybe I said it. But it's no less a reality that the Catholic Church is the supreme teaching authority on earth with respect to faith and morals. Now, our culture would laugh us in the face at that statement. And those worldly, political, bureaucratic, you know, people that are opposed to God will laugh at that. But that doesn't mean it's not true. And that's my point is I want to lead people to that. That's my job as a priest, no matter in what capacity I'm ministering. So if you are embracing these evils and these lies that are satanic, and I want to go into some of those lists because, Jim, you fight for the biggest cause of all, you know, the right to life and the men's march, etc. But if we're embracing those things and they're a sinful reality in our lives, we can go give other examples as well. And we instinctively know they're wrong. Again, you can't read people's consciences, but we want to be true if our prayers are to be heard. That's the point of this impenitent sinner. Whoever lives in this deplorable condition should be vehemently exhorted to wean himself from all affection to sin and return to God in good earnest and from the heart. And that's where I want to go back to this article on this traditional movement that's going on in the country that actually the political press is putting out there. This isn't from the Catholic Church, but I was talking about this movement, and I actually was able to be here. Actually, we had to go back in 1993 when John Paul II went to Denver. As seminarians, we had to travel and make that trip. So it's talking about that particular time in this article. The article says, if this movement emerged from anywhere, that is this traditional movement, it might be a now demolished Denver football stadium and a borrowed military helicopter carrying in Pope John Paul II. Some half a million people descended on Denver in 1993 for the Catholic Festival World Youth Day. When the Pope's helicopter landed just outside Mile High Stadium, the ground shook from the stomping. The Pope whose grandfatherly appearance belied an electric charisma and who was beloved both for his kindness and his sternness, 
confronted an American church shaped by three decades of progressive change. If the church is often best known to non-Catholics for its opposition to abortion, it had grown increasingly liberal since Vatican II. Birth control was quietly accepted in many parishes, and confession barely mentioned. Catholic social teaching on poverty suffused churches. Most priests traded in their cassocks for plain black shirts with Roman collars. Incre incense in Latin became increasingly rare. On some issues, just one more paragraph, John Paul II agreed with these liberal-minded Catholics. He spoke against capital punishment and pushed for workers' rights. He preached relentlessly about forgiveness, the oxygen that purifies the air of hatred. He forgave his own would-be assassin, but he was also uncompromising on dogma warning about change and cracking down on liberal theologians. He urged return to forgotten rituals. Catholics are in danger of losing their faith, he said. He told crowds at the final day of Edinburgh Mass, decrying abortion, drug abuse, and what he called sexual disorders, a barely veiled reference to growing acceptance of gay rights. And the list goes on and on, Jim. So you name your poison. That's my point in bringing this up is that we want to first be people of truth when we offer our petitions to God. If we're living and embracing these things, and how many Catholics, we're seeing the fruits of what John Paul II was talking about. And that, you know, this all started way before him, but it's running rampant now. And so if we, this is, I want to get back to the fruits and how our prayers are heard. You know, and what prayers does God hear? And why do so many people come to me still and say, Father, I'm praying, but God isn't answering my prayers, so I've stopped praying. I hear that all the time as a priest. So, again, the whole point is to let's first start with embracing the truth. Jim, we're trying to lead people to the truth on this show. And let's start from yeah. there, okay? Yeah, of course. And what uh, what was the uh, publication of that article again? What was the... Uh the medium on that, the well, not the medium. It was an article from who? AP Press or U.S. AP News. Press, okay. So yeah, what yes. is ridiculous? What what I find most ridiculous in it is their the way they want to kind of parse up the Catholic faith and and say like, look, everything that expresses um, any sort of outward appearance that this person actually believes what the Catholic church teaches like that is uh that's old school. That's old fashioned. Uh, anything that get, does away with any sort of outward appearance, like they actually believe it. Yeah. Bring it on. And what are they trying to get at? They're trying to just simply attack what the church teaches, who the church is. The fact is, is like, this is who the church is. These are the doctrines on faith and morals. Look, this is what Jesus again, suffered, died, rose to give us this is the this is the invitation. This is what it is. You're either in or you're out. You either say yes or you say no. That's up to you. And um, we say that, uh, hey, come on in and find out if you strive to actually live it and actually live the teachings as if they are real because they are and, and just advance with as much faith as you can muster. You will find out for yourself this is real. You will experience God and these teachings come alive in your life in a way that leaves you no doubt. Okay. But when they try to parse it out and say like, like the liberal thing is uh, forgiveness. Look how liberal he's being when he forgives. Look, we, last week we talked about a, a section in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. I don't think we talked much about the section on forgiveness. Go, I think I, I uh, recommended people to go read it themselves. It's amazing. It's the best treatise on forgiveness I've ever seen, right? And you could call this traditional Catholic because it's from 1566. Look, you pull out the Catechism of St. Augustine from the 400s, or you're going to find the same things, right? This is what it is. So this is just what it is to be Catholic. And they don't like it because they don't believe in it. Um, but we like it who do believe in it because it's real and we love Jesus. We want to love him back. We want to receive the gift he suffered and died to give us, the gift of himself and his one true holy apostolic church. So we want to say yes. We want to move forward in a life of prayer. When we get back, we're going to dive in to those fruits. Why aren't you heard sometimes when you pray, when you ask for things, prayers of petition? Why sometimes do you not receive what you ask for? We're going to get into that. Stay tuned. 
Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Jeff Fashion. You can support his good work by going to givesendgo.com slash veritas. That's givesendgo.com slash veritas. Talking about the apostolicity of the church and prayer, its nature, fruits, and parts today. Uh, if you do want to get a call in, last chance to do so right now. Any comment, question that you have, one 511 5483 That's one 511 5483 Father Fashion. Jim, I think before the last break, you made the great point that in the Catholic Church, there aren't room for political labels like liberal and conservative. You either embrace the true Catholic faith, the doctrine that's been handed on to us, or you don't. So, you know, the point it is starting with prayer that we're going to get into now is that let's first embrace the truth and, and do our best to live it. That might not mean that we might not fall, but we're actually embracing you know, beginning with a, a true foundation of these realities that most of the world rejects, you know, because the world and Catholicism will always be diametrically opposed. So prayer is our duty toward God. That's why we're talking about it. it's, you know, it's twofold. Our duty is to pray and to love or practice charity. So um, the catechism talks about the fruits of prayer and how prayer honors God, but it makes the point, and it's a very good one, that we have to pray with perseverance. So St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that when we go to pray, there's two specific dispositions that must be present, and that is faith. We must just believe without question in God and that he has the power to grant what's conducive for the salvation and good of our souls, and we have to pray with humility. But the Catechism says that we have to be assiduous in our prayer. He says, those therefore, the Catechism says, those therefore who do not practice assiduous and regular prayer deprive themselves of a powerful means of attaining gifts of a singular value. So we have to persevere. And just a great example, there are many more of them. And when it comes to doctrine, Jim, don't listen to Father Fashing. Listen to the doctors and fathers of the church, St. Athanasius, St. Augustine. St. Augustine's mentioned here. Listen to the saints, okay? I'm just telling you, in my limited way, what they've already taught, okay? I don't give you my opinion, Father Fashion. It's what the fathers and doctors of the church have taught. The catechism is telling us that we have to persevere in prayer. And that's one of the main stumbling blocks for people that i found, Jim. Um, St. Monica, St. Augustine's mother, is one of the greatest well-known examples of one who persevered. It took all those years of praying without ceasing to convert St. Augustine, but she never stopped. So if there's a specific thing that we want from God, We have to truly and firmly believe he has the power to give it to us. And we have to ask him with humility, St. Thomas says, and we have to persevere. We have to not stop asking because if we think we can pray for, oh, a few weeks for something in particular or a year or two or a few years even and then stop, that's not enough. We have to be willing to persevere to the end. It may take a lifetime of prayer, but I guarantee you this, if you do stop praying, you're likely, very likely, not to get what you're asking for. So you may not get it in your time, but if God wants it for you, he's going to give it to you in his time. And that's where the faith part comes in, and the perseverance, okay, and the trust, and the humility, okay, because we are raised to, and I'm guilty of this too, to have everything when we want it, you know, right when we want it. You know, we're not patient, okay? That's a challenge for all of us, okay? We have to realize that God answers in his own time, and that's the point of persevering. We have to have those dispositions present. So the point is we can't stop, okay? And then I talk a lot about how we have to ask things in their proper order. The catechism doesn't really specific mention this, but just real quick, we have to really want the most important and higher things if we expect to get all the other things from God. So We can only look into our own hearts and know for sure if we really are people who have sincere contrition, we really are trying to amend our lives, we really, you know, want to make a 180-degree turn to go a different way. You know, those higher things we have to really want. And those are things that they take a lifetime of achieving, right? True repentance, true conversion, like not going back to our old ways. If we're not at least really wanting those things when we pray, we're likely never going to get the other things we're praying for. And the catechism kind of alludes to that. But it says those who don't practice assiduous and regular prayer deprive themselves of a powerful means of attaining a, a singular value. And so it goes on to talk about the fruits of prayer. And this necessity of prayer is also productive of the greatest delight and usefulness since it bears most abundant fruits. Well, what are those fruits? 
it honors God. Again, it's our duty as his creatures to pray. And so we have to realize that it's sinful not to pray every day. Okay, this is why parents have this huge responsibility when they choose to cooperate with God's grace and bringing children into the world. They have such a responsibility in teaching them in the ways of prayer. And we can't just say, go to your room and learn the rosary and the Our Fathers and the Catechism. They have to see us praying. And this goes back to, Jim, on so many levels, what's going wrong in the church is that we're not seeing our fathers, our leaders, our clergy, our hierarchy prostrate before the Blessed Sacrament exposed, teaching people to pray by example like so many saints have throughout the ages. St. John Vianney is just one of a long list of many examples. There are many women religious as well. But that's what the church needs. That's where the revival comes from. People want to follow priests and bishops. They want to be able to trust them. Please let us pray that one day they can give us reason to. And so it's not a matter of spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on paraphernalia, and this is what you have to do. And this, it's, it's like the same principle. You can't tell your children to go do something. They're going to learn by watching and doing what you do. The same holds true for our priests and religious. We're just, not, we're just not seeing them give the great example. And obviously it's not every last one, but as a whole, this is why you know, we have such confusion and division. So there are fruits from prayer. It honors God. We do our duty by giving this honor to him, and that's why it's so important how we choose to pray, what form of mass we choose to embrace. Prayer obtains what we request, okay? And it's interesting how the catechism, as it should, frequently brings up the devil, the enemy of prayer, okay? Satan wants to do everything in his power to stop you from praying because he knows it unites you with God. That's the last thing he wants, and it glorifies God. So prayer, we secure the guidance and aid of the Holy Spirit, the security and preservation of the faith, deliverance from punishment, divine protection under temptation, victory over the devil. In a word, there is prayer, there is in prayer an accumulation of spiritual joy, and hence our Lord said, ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. So it goes right back to the heart of what the show is about, spiritual warfare. If we are not people of prayer, we have no chance against Satan. If we are not men and women of prayer, we have absolutely no chance. And that's the problem that's infected the church and our culture is people, Jim, have just wanted to or have allowed God to be rooted almost completely out of their lives. And they're so busy and chaotic and they're trying to do so many different things instead of simplifying, getting back to what is really essential. And that is this union with God. I'm not talking about being some kind of monk or in a monastery in a cloistered religious. I'm talking about a basic calling to mind the fact that by virtue of your baptism, you have God dwelling within your soul. And we just want to acknowledge that, as we were talking about in the beginning of the show, in some sort of structured way throughout the day. And it's different for everybody depending upon one's vocation. But the bottom line is, no matter what our vocation is, we are to be men and women of prayer because it's, again, part of our twofold duty to God. Right. Yeah. And just to say too, yeah, there, and there are benchmarks that God wants to lead us to. So one of those benchmarks is to be in that state of sanctifying grace to believe all that the Catholic church teaches on faith and morals. So your prayer up until getting to that point, God is, is trying to draw you there. And then once you're there, then your prayer is going to be even more powerful, more efficacious. Uh, a lot in here about why um, unwise and indevout prayers are unheard. You can check that self- stuff out yourself. Catechism of the Council of Trent. A lot, a lot of great stuff. Father, can you lead us out with a final blessing? Sure. Dominus hubiscum et cum spiritu tuo et vidictio de omnipotentis patris et fili et spiritu sancti descenda supervos et mani et semper. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.